there. The most iconic image that represents modern warfare and armament would undoubtedly be the silhouette of the main battle tank. The story of armor is the one most reflecting how the advancement of technology and military affairs can seesaw from the aggressor to defender and back again in a constant one-upmanship. For armor was considered the antidote to a particular battlefield problem, be it sword, pike or arrow. It would then become the military technician's job to pierce this new barrier, then once achieved better armor is forged and so on. So eventually personal armor was defeated by the age of high power bullets. As the amount of metal required to stop such shot was deemed totally impractical to carry into combat. Although historically, the use of ballistic body armor did appear from time to time in such places as the American Civil War, where it appears to have saved the life of at least one army officer. And in the attempt to escape the law, Australian bushranger Ned Kelly and his gang donned heavy iron body armor and helmets fashioned from plows. They did not fare quite as well. To defeat modern machine guns and artillery projectiles required more mass than a man could carry. But a motorized vehicle, on the other hand, could. The Romans built a siege engine called the gallery. It provided protection for the soldiers within as it approached a castle wall. Even da Vinci made conceptual drawings of an armored vehicle. With the Industrial Revolution, armored vehicles were being realistically conceptualized around the turn of the century. There were prototypes of various machines put to paper, and some even made it off the drawing board. In 1896, an American, E.J. Pennington, suggested an armored car with two machine guns and surrounded with plate steel. A motor scout, a four-wheeled bicycle carrying a Maxim gun with a bulletproof shield to protect the gunner, was suggested by British engineer F.R. Sims in 1899. In 1902, Mr. Sims went on to design a war car with a new Daimler internal combustion engine, two Maxim machine guns, and a one-pounder naval gun. It was manufactured by Vickers and had a top speed of nine miles per hour. H.G. Wells, in a 1903 article in the Strand newspaper, wrote about the land ironclad. It stirred people into considering land cruisers and battleships. The various technologies were available, however, just not combined in the right or practical mix. In 1906, the Holt Company of the USA fitted a steam tractor with a tracked suspension. A year later, British company Hornsby built a petrol-driven tracked vehicle in response to a request from the War Office. The following year, a Major Donoghue took the Hornsby proposal and suggested adding armor and producing a gun carrier. Discouraged by bureaucratic stalling, Hornsby sold their patent to Holt. 1912 saw Australian engineer de Mull present a set of drawings to the War Department of a fully armored tracked vehicle, as too did an Austrian, Burstin, who produced drawings of a lozenge-shaped fighting vehicle. In 1914, three armored vehicles were built, based on a Rolls-Royce chassis with a Maxim machine gun mounted on a turret with 360 degrees of traverse. But an established military machine with its core of infantry, cavalry and artillery could see little use in these armored vehicles. A few far-sighted people, however, did see a practical use for such a mobile force. One man, an ex-soldier who had fought the Boers in South Africa and later turned to politics and eventually become the first Lord of the Admiralty, conceived of some daring uses for an armed vehicle, 
He was a young Winston Churchill. Churchill wrote several proposals for the defense of the nation, which included the use of vehicles carrying Maxim guns or cannon, able to maneuver on the battlefield and defend British air bases in Europe. With the commencement of World War I, it quickly became apparent that military doctrine and battlefield tactics based on the past had no hope of being effective against the new weapons of war, namely machine gun, massed artillery fire, and aircraft. The swift movement of the armies of old ground to a halt, literally, and descended into the hell of trench warfare. For some commanders, it was a matter of relying on the old ways. For others, they were hoping for new battlefield initiatives. Perhaps technology would change the balance. Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Swinton of the British Royal Engineers was sent to the battlefields of France to see for himself the situation and perhaps suggest a method of breaking the trench stalemate. Swinton had seen exactly the same conditions some years earlier in Manchuria during the Sino-Japanese conflict. They had used new weapons with old tactics and had also ground to a halt. Swinton had suggested back then that a method of breaching the trenches needed to be found, perhaps with an armored caterpillar with a halt track mechanism. A member of the Defense Committee, Lieutenant Colonel Morris Hankey, ran this idea against overall rebukes from the committee, but undeterred, took a refined version to cabinet. This proposal included bulletproof rollers for the tracks. Churchill was impressed and encouraged this development. One naval captain, T. Tullock, advanced the suggestion of land cruisers and land destroyers. Even a land battleship carried on massive 40-foot wheels. Churchill could see merit and advanced 70,000 pounds of Admiralty money towards a pilot model. Little Willie was conceived and built with Maxim machine guns and a 57 millimeter naval cannon and a suspension track system developed by Wilson. The device was coming to fruition and was classified top secret. A new name was to replace landship and it was dubbed the tank. Churchill continued to develop his thoughts on the tactical methodology of this new weapon. Soon Big Willie, or Tank Mark I, was completed. It weighed in at 30 tons with a 105 horsepower engine. The male version carried two cannons, the female two Maxim machine guns. 100 were immediately ordered. Swinton began to develop the how-to manual for the troops who were about to become tank men. General Haig needed all the help he could get on the Somme offensive and eagerly accepted 50 tanks with only partially trained crews. Something was better than nothing. However, the doctrine in use of these vehicles was confused and ill-defined. Few, if any, tanks had radio, most would rely on visual signals for communications. A day of battle, the 15th August. Of the 49 tanks available, only 36 reached the start line. A single tank, numbered D1, moved off and assaulted the German lines with machine guns blazing and was unceremoniously hit and instantly put out of action. But it was the first tank attack in history. A second front of tanks moved ahead with greater success. Tank number D-16 moved into the small town of Fleur, followed by infantry. Three battalions of Germans fell. Another tank, D-5, late into the action due to mechanical trouble, punched straight through the lines and on to the enemy artillery placements. A duel ensued, tank versus artillery. The tank did well until it had to withdraw when it was hit and set alight. 
Individual tanks did achieve a lot, 